So um, I'm JJ Kathy. I just got hired at the weirdest time to ever get hired at Elantrust, uh, and it's been super fun. And uh, we were sort of brainstorming how we could get volunteers together without physically getting volunteers together. So um, my background is in invasive species, and the main way that we collect data for um, invasive projects, even the you know Department of Agriculture and DEC uh, uses it, is IMAP, which anybody can add to. And uh, I don't think enough people know about it. So if you would like to, and we're gonna get to it later as well, you can put in the uh, web address that I have right under the title here, newyorkimapinvasives.org. So you can feel free to do that. And, um, and if you don't have um, a smartphone or aren't very much into the, the technological aspect of it, we are gonna go over a little ID, so hopefully you can have some takeaways anyhow. Can I change the slide? Okay. <laughs> so a lot of people probably know what invasive species are. Um, so we're going to go over a little bit of that just, you know, so we're all on the same page. Um, and how to use the database and how we can apply it to um, our local PCAs. Um, that's a little, one of the instar phases of spotted lanternfly, which is an invasive species that I love to hate, so we'll go over that one later. Um, so yeah, invasive species are introduced species, plants or animals um, that somehow harm the environment because they throw off native ecosystems. So you probably know a lot of these, the ones that we hate most, <laughs> giant hogweed and emerald ash borer, you know what they did. And the reason that we should care is because, um, you know, they degrade the ecosystems that we know. Um, my grandparents and parents grew up with a different forest than I grew up with, and the, the changes take place over many, many years. So even though it might not feel like the things that we do today make a difference with invasive species, it'll have an impact down the road um, on all the things left to do. So this is, I put this slide in because this is what my mother always says to me about the honeysuckle that she has in the front garden. I'm like, mom, you gotta get rid of that. And she says, but the birds like it. So I made this slide for the people who see that happening because it is um, a little bit confusing to, uh, see a lot of the pollinators and birds and wildlife interacting with the invasive species. Um, but overall, biodiversity is better because invasives over time form a monoculture, um, which I made the analogy in here that, uh, or on, in other uh, presentations, that it's like a community drinking only soda and no water. So um, a lot of the invasive species, like the honeysuckle berries here, the birds will eat it but overall it's not a healthy choice for them. And uh, if it's the only choice then, so, so that's, that's the reason why it matters. Um, but today we're going over how to, when you see the invasives, how to help by giving organizations that deal with invasive management the data that they need to do the most effective work possible. Um, and the way that that data is used is sort of, like I said, it seems a little silly to say, okay, you know, here's one Norway maple. Let me take a picture of it and make one point. Well, you know, how is that helping? But in the grand scheme, um, those points end up forming patterns and um, it makes it easier for the state to track the distribution of species um, so that we can sort of prevent, you know, the next not weed or the next garlic mustard. Um, and that's called early detection rapid response. Uh, so every time you take a point, it is helpful because it's just a tiny point in a big shape. So, um, so when we get onto the website, you'll, you have a few different data types that you can choose from. Um, and this has been recent. There have been some uh, updates in the way that IMAP works. And so the most recent one I think is the best and most effective. Um, so the different data types that you can choose from are presence, uh, not detected or, ask, or uh, absence and treatment. So instead of just saying a point, you know, I saw this, you can say, say you're looking for hemlock willow you delgid. Um, you can approach a bunch of hemlocks and say, yes, I did find it, presence. And here's the polygon of where the trees are. Um, not detected. I looked at the hemlocks. I didn't see any adelgid on them. So here's the absence region. Um, and treatment would be, I came across a patch of garlic mustard and I pulled it off. And here's the area that 
I pulled. And um, you have to make sure that if you're using the mobile device that your GPS unit is on. Um, but other times there are ways to do it after the fact. You know, I'll remember I saw, you know, a patch of invasives at a specific parking lot, you know, and I'll zoom in and I know that it's on the eastern end of the parking lot. So just to be aware of the location that you're at to get the most accuracy is also important. And the data um, after you submit it, since um, you're all volunteers with Columbia Land Conservancy, if you're on a property of ours, um, IMAP gives organizations like ours the opportunity to create a project to organize our data better. So your data would go to me, JJ, which would go to CLC. And uh, we can organize it further than that. So right now we just recently started a project that should be available to add to soon, which is the High Falls Invasives area. So if you see something in High Falls, then you can put it right in our folder for us. Um, so there's, like I mentioned, there's two ways to access IMAP. There's the smartphone and the online. Really, you have to use both of them in tandem, if at all. Um, but uh, the mobile app um, allows you to get things in the field. You can do it without a connection, which I'll talk about later too. And the entire database is visible. So if you want to go over all the things that you did submit, it's easier to be on a PC, but you have to be um, connected to Wi-Fi for that, of course. Um, and there's sort of different experiences. So we'll go through what each of those looks like. So the first thing that we're going to do is create an IMAP Invasives account, um, if you haven't already, and that should be pretty simple because you could just go to um, imapinvasives.org or nyimapinvasives.org. Um, it'll have you pick your home state under the jurisdiction drop down, um, and you just fill out your name and email um, like you would any other type of account. So, um, and, and you have to confirm as well. So they'll send you an email and then you just click the link and you should be all good to go. Um, so we might, we'll probably have a chance at the end to go over that if anybody has any problems with it. But um, the first thing that you see when you go to IMAP online is this, which I think overwhelms and confuses a lot of people, or at least it did for me. Um, because there's no way that I need to see the entire continent of data. Um, so uh, some of the things that we're gonna go over, I'll stop sharing and then I'll open my own IMAP account. Um, hopefully you'll have gone to nyimapinvasives or imapinvasives.org, uh, log in or create an account. And, and if you, you, know, you don't have the time to do that right now, you can just follow along with them, what I'm doing and um, refer to the recording or email me if you have questions. Um, so we'll just zoom around and play with it for a little bit. And IMAP actually created a fake species option so that we can fool around with it without messing up anybody's data. So let's see. Now I'm going to screen share IMAP with you. <laughs> All right, so here's what I said it looks super overwhelming. <clears throat> um, this was a little bit confusing for me as well. Um, I'm trying to minimize the video here. <clears throat> um, if I was looking for a conservation area, I would put it in here, and that's not the right thing to do. That, that is really for IMAP personnel to use. So on this toolbar over here, you can put on, you know, um, the area that we're talking about. So uh, High Falls is one of the areas in bases, um, that has invasives that we want to document. Um, and one of the things on the to-do list was to use the measure tool. So you can see all these points here. So this is actually pretty cool because I found that I could select the points that were there and look at them, and it was a bunch of you guys taking <laughs> taking points on, uh, I believe it was, it was Hemlock Willie Adelgid. 
So, um, let's see. That tells you how big the acre the acreage is, and then if you click see what's here, then you can see maybe what's in your neighborhood, or um, add a PCA that's near you. <laughs> I'm doing my personal laptop, so it's a little slow. So yeah, you can you can see that uh, by name, we've had people adding hemlock woolly adalgid presence points, barberry presence points hemlock scale and knotweed, all of which we definitely have there. Um, and these people put in their organization. So that's another thing that I would like to go over is that um, if we create a record, um, we have a presence of, yeah, wait, fine, or polygon. Um, we found a whole patch of fantasy species right there. Not real, fake species for testing. <laughs> but there was a lot of it. There was about a half acre of that fake species. Um, so you'll automatically be in there as the observer if you're logged in. And the date also autofills, which is handy. And then uh, the project, since I'm part of the organization, um, which you can request to be a part of as well, um, this comes up as our project because it knows that we're in this area. Um, and this is the only downside of using the online is that you can't, it, you can add a photo, but I have to somehow have it on my computer. So that is an option if that's easier for you to have a digital camera and put it on the computer and drag and drop that in. Um, because the data is much more valuable with the picture so that it can actually be confirmed. Um, and I'll say, you know, we found big patch of it but it was sparse so that's our percent cover if it's big or if you there was only a few individuals you could put how many you saw um and the the density this is sort of like a qualitative aspect of it um there was just a few it was really dense it was a monoculture it was linearly scattered means it was like along a roadside or along a stream um so I'll say that it was, we had scattered clumps, which this is a pretty vague but common invasive dispersal I've found is five to 25% and sparse. Um, and in the comments, you can say, you know, it was east of the barn or, you know, um, near the giant oak tree stump. And that ends up being more helpful than you might think <laughs> for the people that work with it. Um, so it would have our photo there. That's the summary of what we're gonna input. And I can hit complete. And then it'll stay there. And, um, and then if somebody uses the identify tool, they can see that I recorded all that fake species that we have down there on the creek. <clears throat> so that I believe is the, um, I'm gonna stop sharing really quick to just sort of run through. Mm -hmm. This share screen thing is no joke. I feel you all on <laughs> having some trouble. Um, so there are a lot of other things that you can do on IMAP online. Um, if you wanna just look around your general region, um, you can change the base map um, to show a satellite image. If you say, oh, I know it was by that you know house with the tin roof. Um, it's pretty user friendly, um, but it's it's easier, I think, to uh, understand exactly what's happening with the data if you do it from your phone, which we'll also go over. <clears throat> so if you have any questions to stick in the chat box or things, um, things that you just want to dump out of your brain <laughs> quickly before we get to the end, then I encourage you to send it to Doug and we will go over them at the end. I just think it would be nice to take a little, if there's anything that's bothering you, to write it down <laughs> or give it a uh, second. Hey, JJ, so uh, had two questions come up and maybe this is a good time for you to answer them uh, in addition to what we've thrown in there. Um, but, so you've created a project for High Falls. Are there other projects for 
the other PCAs or is that something that we will have up and running shortly? Yeah, that's, that's something that um, we're looking to add um, in the near future. Um, we started with High Falls because that's specifically a project that we've been looking into. We think it, it will be effective to complete some invasives management there um, specifically, just based on the fact that it's a habitat that we want to protect and the species that are there are particularly insidious. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, yeah. Great. So, so there will be more projects for specific PCAs as we as we roll those out. Um, and then the other question is: Is it more helpful to have um, points or polygons? Um, I found that uh, when you know, if you come across a, pot, a patch that's that's sizable, and you can, there's a lot of estimating that goes on. Unfortunately, you know, it's impossible to really understand exactly the the constraints you're working with. So if you can say um, less than an acre, more than an acre. Um, but if you find one, you know, if you find the first stalk of knotweed, then that's really valuable information too. Uh, so that would be a good point because you can bring that person ground truthing it directly there. Um, but if you say, wow, my whole backyard is filled with barberry, then you can just select your whole backyard. Um, okay. that's, valuable too. that's great. And then the, the last question we have, um, do we have to include a photo uh, to record your observation? Um, you don't have to. It like you can physically hit submit and it goes into the system. Um, however, every point and this is a cool thing about IMAP. Every every point um, gets um, looked over and uh, reviewed by the New York State botanists and their staff. Um, so in order for them to confirm it. And for it to be used as data um, in their projects, then there has to be a photo because that plays into them confirming it. Um, if if you don't have a photo, then it won't get confirmed, and it'll show up as sort of red instead of green as an unconfirmed, um, which can still be useful to you know if it's in a sea of confirmed uh, species, then it does show some type of pattern. But it's really best to get a photo. Yep. Okay. Awesome. So photos where we can um, and then specific projects on the PCAs and polygons are good for big patches. All right, um, so if anybody else has any other questions as we move forward, feel free, to, feel free to throw them in the chat box and Rebecca and I will try to get you an answer um, and otherwise we'll continue forward and we'll deal with uh, all the questions at the end. My, my pace might be a little fast, I'm just trying to see. I know there's a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> they, they add up and I'm still sharing right okay cool <clears throat> so the mobile application is what I have more experience with because it's easier to carry into the woods <laughs> um, let me put this down. Uh, so yeah the mobile app has some uh, advantages which my favorite of which is uh, that you can use it offline because I also rarely have Wi-Fi when in the middle of the woods um, it's not through your internet browser, so that can get a little confusing if you open Google or Internet Explorer on your phone and type in IMAP invasives, then it'll actually bring you to that big continent with all the honeycombs on it. Um, so you have to go through Google Play or the Apple App Store, wherever you get your apps, and um, grab this one, and it'll be a lot easier <laughs> than doing that. Um, so the first thing you have to do is create an account and log in which is just really a reminder to go to that web page. Easier to do on a desktop, which I know all of you have, so that's cool. So you're all on them. Um, and just put in your first last name and email, and then it'll let you log right in. Um, also, when you have the mobile app, it brings you to a welcome screen every single time, which can <laughs> throw you off. It'll have little drawn circles on it, and it'll tell you what to do. So don't be thrown by that. Um, and just that will be also under the, the preferences. So you can, after you log in, these are just good things to practice. Um, you can set your preference to the jurisdiction that you're in, which will be New York. Um, your username and email will be in there. Um, and also under preferences, you can, if you're into this sort of thing, um, you can change it to show scientific names alphabetically, common names alphabetically, both of them. You can um, choose which ones you're going to see most commonly so that your drop down list is shorter. 
Um, those are all good things to do on the computer as well. Um, so depending on your familiarity and your comfort level um, with technology in general, um, those are sort of all optional things uh, just to make it more streamlined. Um, and then I definitely encourage everybody to go out if they are using the smartphone option to add the fake species observation like I just did. Um, you can do a point, a line, or a polygon. The, the line would be um, obviously a series of points. Again, it's good for like a long roadside. Um, and just see if you can upload it and um, play around with that. And of course, we're all here if you have questions in the future going forward. Um, so this is actually a really nice run through from IMAP. Um, it shows this blank area. And then in the upper corner, you can add an observation, which brings you to this screen. And then um, if you've already taken a photo, if I'm in a rush, I usually take a photo and then I put my phone back in my pocket and then I can go back and do this later. You can select a photo from your library or take a photo right then. Um, oh, yep, that's just an overview of that. <laughs> um, the custom species list is if you've chosen the species you see most often. Um, but if you haven't, it'll just show you all of them that you can choose from and they're alphabetical. So you select from that drop down list, like you just saw me do with the fake species. Um, another thing that is tricky is that you can't, you watched me type in fake species on the online version. There's no typing option when you're on your phone. So you have to just scroll until you find it. That's I think why they introduced the custom list. And I think a lot of people have gotten on IMAP's case about that. So it's something that they're, they've definitely looked into. Um, presence or absence. Uh, the date usually autofills, so that's also handy. And then the way that you select your point, if you have a GPS already on on your phone, um, it'll be where you're standing. So just make sure that if that's how it's collecting the data, that where you're standing is where it was and you didn't wait till you got home or back to the office. I've done that quite a few times. <laughs> so if that box is checked, then it'll turn it on for you. Um, and then if you say, oh, well, I'm back in the car, but I know that it was over next to the stream, um, then you can just move the push pin around um, and drag it to the location. Um, this drop down means, you know, it says road right now. You can also do satellite or terrain, just like on any other Google map. Um, the zoom in or out function, I think that one's self explanatory. That's you. Um, and yeah, the, uh, the coordinates will also show up. Um, I, you could probably type them in if you happen to know them, but um, it would be crazy. And then here's where you put in um, Columbia Land Conservancy in the project. So the project would come up as High Falls Conservation Area, Ooms Conservation Area. Um, and the organization comes up as Columbia Land Trust. Um, I can honestly tell you that I've never filled out the amount of minutes that I spent searching. Um, I, I think that my data is still valid without adding that. But if you want to throw an estimate in there, I'm sure IMAP appreciates it. And then I said the comments are helpful, especially if you say, yeah, next to, you know, the DMV or next to the intersection with the stoplight. Yep, and then save. That's a huge bummer if you forget that too, also speaking from experience. So this is the screen that you're gonna see after, you know, you've been in the fields, you haven't uploaded a lot of things. Um, you know, <laughs> I ended up with many of those yellow bars of many of the observations. Um, I think I had like 150 of them. And then you check the box and um, upload them when you are connected to Wi-Fi. So it'll have the location in there, you know, the burning bush, the barberry, and the porcelain berry that are all on that list of the cell phone that guy's holding. Um, it'll maintain the location for all of them, even if you are in your house on your Wi-Fi. Um, so once you're on your Wi-Fi, you upload those by checking the boxes. Um, but I found when I, if you're a crazy person and you have 150 observations and try to upload them all at once, it usually doesn't go well. And I emailed IMAP about it and they said, listen, you're a crazy person. Please try to do them five or 10 at a time. 
that was much easier. Um, I think I even got up to doing about 20 at a time, but it'll, it will be bogged down if you try to do several. Um, and then it'll ask you just to confirm. Um, so yeah, because there is sort of a lot to learn, um, there is a lot of, they have really good resources on how to do this because they're training volunteers all the time. Um, so those are all available at, through the um, IMAP Invasives website. Um, the help and resources tab is right between who we are in action. Um, but I'll also uh, be sending them out on the follow-up email. Um, so you can click on those in addition to some other resources um, that are things that I just find helpful. Um, and there have been a lot of other webinars just like this one. Um, so if for some reason, um, you know, the natural heritage um, group did a easier to follow presentation or a longer one that's more in depth, um, those are all on YouTube. So that's super helpful. Um, just in general, I'm always usually like working hard when I see invasives. So I end up getting a little shaky. <laughs> I have some blurry pictures. So I have to take three or four because you have to remember that a state botanist is looking over every one of these photos and it'll just make their job easier to not have to say like, what is this picture of? Um, and this one, you know, you can't really confirm that that's hemlock woolly adalgid and not snow. Um, but the, the good pictures are difficult to get. And I would say a picture at all is better than none. Um, so yeah. So I think those, so we went over the online and the mobile app. Um, if you would like to uh, get any more questions out, purge some <laughs> confusion. JJ, we had a, a couple questions. Um, which I tried to answer. Um, so there's an option for uh, captive plants in the in the selection thing. Um, what does it mean for a plant to be captive? Yeah, that does sound pretty nefarious when you put it like that. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of them will say um, the captive is just means intentional planting. I kind of felt that the checkbox said intentional planting, but I wouldn't. Captive doesn't surprise me either. Um, that's basically if you see, um, I've even been at DEC campgrounds and seen, oh my gosh, a barberry. And then you look around and you realize there are some stones around it and a flag. So that means it was, it was planted there, um, which is valuable information because if it was the first one planted in the county, then that would be a hotspot for that species. So that just means someone's gardening. Yep. Okay. And then the um, other question is, uh, when you find an invasive, is there an option for unsure or I don't know uh, when you select species? Um, I think it's best to put in the species that you think it is and then it gets corrected either way. Um, I sort of had that same hope um, when I started using the app because there were a lot of things that I didn't know. Um, if you put it as something that has never been seen before, um, then you might get an email if you accidentally, you know, I remember I knew I put the wrong species of viburnum in because I got an email that said, this is the first one recorded in the county. Um, so since IMAP's a pretty small group, they can troubleshoot those things with a human being um, pretty quickly. I usually put in the observation comments, you know, not positive needs confirmation on species ID. Okay. Um, and are there any resources or tools that you would recommend for people who are having trouble um, identifying the plants out there? Yeah, so one of the, the links that I intend to send out after this um, is uh, the PRISMS, the Partners for Regional Invasive Species Management, um, two of which I have been employed at, and those are really good people. Um, they have put together some fact sheets and uh, really easily navigable um, lists, uh, species index. So the one that I plan to send out is the Lower Hudson Prism Species Index, which is pretty good, and um, the New York State Invasives Clearinghouse. So you get some links for those, and you know, I'm a nerd for this stuff, so if you have any other, if you want to read more about it, I have an infinite supply of those <laughs> sort of things. Okay. Yep. Um, and then another question is, uh, how do you create a project? 
Um, so you can create a project on the, it's easier on the online interface. Um, when you like add a new um, observation, um, it does give you the option to create a project, but if you're not a part of an organization that's listed, um, then it'll go as a personal project. Um, so for example, you know, a volunteer couldn't create a project that was a part of CLC as an organization uh, because their account isn't associated with, um, with CLC. Um, okay. We had this issue the other day when I made a project, but I, I wasn't accepted as the, <laughs> as the leader of the CLC on IMAP. So um, it didn't come up, but you can create a project even if it's just your own backyard. Yep. Great. <laughs> um, so does anybody else have any other questions? We can, um, you know, maybe take it off screen share for a minute and open, open up and turn the mute off. And if anybody has uh, anything they want to, uh, they need help sorting out or just trying to understand better, um, we're happy to work you through those problems. And I'm probably going to assume by your silence that you're all experts at this already. Uh, looking for a refresher, and you're going to hop out there and just get going. Tracy, was that a hand? Yeah, that was a that that was like that was a raising my hand thing. So I'm on the app, and I remember before we had um, the the custom list. And is there a place when I hit an unselected? Is there a place I can add um, the CLC? Um, actually, what you guys are all looking for. Wasn't there at one point, uh, you know, th that you guys were just working specifically with certain invasives and you had your own little um, section or whatever, um, like instead of being all of New York State and Syracuse, it was CLC uh, stuff. Is that, am I missing something? Um, no, I, I think you can use the drop down list to put in CLC as the organization and whatever project we're using. Um, but I think the uh, the custom list is set by like user preferences. Um, Got it. So, so yeah, if if you decide to go in there and say, you know, there's absolutely, you know, I'm never going to be looking for mute swan or something, you know, <laughs> then you can take those out. Um, and if there is a way for us to uh, add that in um, as part of our organization, then we'll just let everybody know that we're doing that. Um, if we cool. Find that Got out. it. Yeah. yeah. And Glenda, Glenda had a nice comment too that, um, you know, normally if she sees a single occurrence of say not weed, um, she's out there uh, and just trying to remove it before it spreads. So uh, you don't have to uh, just collect data. Uh, you can also uh, eradicate while you're out there putting things in IMAP. Um, but both are useful and it's useful to know where the occurrences are um, as you are eradicating and removing them. Mm -hmm. There is also that option that I spoke about before to add a uh, treatment. So there's absence, uh, presence, and treated because I too find it difficult to walk past like the one barbary in the forest. Like I gotta get that. Um, mm -hmm. So once I pull it out, you say, well, I'll still, you know, because it would be, you know, when five more barbary pop up a few meters away, then they're going to say, where the heck did this come from? So it's good. Leaving clues is always good. But if you pull it. Darlene, did I see you have a question? No? I think Mary Lou has, Lou has a question now. Yeah. Um, just wondering, there, there's a lot of honeysuckle around my house. Um, obviously, it's and it's buried now. Obviously, I don't want to pull it and leave it lying somewhere. I mean, what's the best thing to do with that? Um, I've always just, I mean, once, once it's fruited, you know, unless you intend to walk around with a garbage bag and pick all the seeds and dispose of them, which is crazy. Um, you know, just take, take the loss and, uh, next, next spring before they've gone to fruit, that's just the best time to cut them or pull them and then just continue doing that over years. Yeah. Once, once they've fruited, it's sort of, I used to work with a guy that would say, you know, all that needs to happen is a bird has to do its business in the forest and it's over. So just don't, don't get too hung up on it, which I did. So yeah, just cut it. Um, 
in the spring or pull it in the spring is the best option. Yeah. And so that's, that's true for a lot of invasives, right? That we want to use that spring emergence to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, our, in those fact sheets that you plan on sharing with everybody is the kind of the timing of uh, good removal listed, or is that something that, you know, we can help people uh, work through if they have questions? Yeah, it, it should be um, the, you know, the best, anything that New York has decided is a best management strategy usually um, incorporates the best time to get it. Um, but if for some reason it doesn't, then you can definitely send us questions. It does vary because some species, um, you know, you want to get right in the spring as soon as it grows, but other species, if you're, you know, treating them or somehow um, spraying them, then you want them to be actively growing. So um, <clears throat> some of them you want to be actively growing when you get it. Some of them you want to be very much dead when you get it. So it does vary. So I would uh, look into it or send us an email. Yeah. Great. Cool. cool. So um, is there any other questions out there? Uh, yeah, I have one. Um, I'm familiar with some invasive species, but I'm really not that well versed in it. Uh, is there a, is there much on the IMAP uh, site, which I have not been on, to, to kind of sort of school myself better about this? Yeah, IMAP definitely has, they, I believe they have a resource tab, um, and they have just, you know, general ID guides. Um, and some of the stuff that I'll be sending out um, is the sort of thing that I've that I've used before, just because I think there's a big variance in the um, how easy those things are to read, you know. <laughs> so and how so, user friendly they are. Yeah. So Matt, uh, right uh, in the primary nyinvasives.org site, there's a uh, towards the bottom of the page, and it's a short page, um, is one called Species of Interest. And if you click through to that, it will give you um, species through the seasons, but also just a list of them. And you're able to kind of look at uh, the specific information about it, why it's a problem, why it's here, um, and then management options, as well as the uh, observed occurrences of them throughout, in this case, the state of New York. Um, Massachusetts may have a similar information about invasives known in the state um, through the state uh, department of conservation resources ecr mm -hmm. cool. yes charlene Thank you. Uh, i wonder specifically in our on our property there are uh, we have not, not many invasives that we're very actively trying to remove putting in garbage bags, bringing to the dump, like huge amounts. Um, that's, um, anyway, I, I gotta remember the name of it. But there are some invasives that we really like and look forward to blossoming, like spotted knapweed is on our hillside, everyone really looks forward to it. And uh, even the mullion we like. Uh, and I wonder if it's terrible to give a pass to those. I mean, um, on the road, is it going to be a bad idea? I mean, there's definitely a lot of um, my my other previous employment is all in garden centers, so I'm very I'm you know very close with a bunch of gardeners to say no, we want that in the garden, you know. Um, and I think probably the best way to go about that is to just make sure it stays contained. Um, so if if you do want it in your yard, then you can keep it in your yard. But if you're any, especially if you're anywhere near a tree line. Um, or any other type of habitat to just watch as it slowly creeps over. And if you monitor that area, then, then yeah, that's as good as, uh, as you can do. Yeah, sure. I would also say that if you have any uh, areas of special significance, whether it be ecological significance like wetlands or rare plants that you do know about, or just areas that you have uh, put a lot of time and stewardship into that you want to try to prevent the spread of those, uh, of the invasives into those special areas. Um, you know, I would say uh, in our instance, some of it does may result in decisions about management. So 
there's not weed in the Agawamic Brook at High Falls. And we could spend a lot of time and engage all of you in helping us remove and try to eradicate that. But as long as it's still upstream, that time is uh, kind of, uh, could be better spent uh, addressing other invasive issues. So you kind of have to weigh those, uh, weigh those decisions about the amount of effort that you're willing to put in uh, to, to manage a specific area and what, what are you trying to, you know, protect or restore um, and think a bit more holistically about that. Um, Thank you. Maureen says uh, that they're having an outbreak of gypsy moths right now and is wondering if there's any resources on gypsy moth control. Um, I am not super familiar with it. I know that's more of a forest pathogen. Uh, I would say get in touch with the folks at DEC or look on the DEC website, um, specifically around the forest uh, foresters end of things. They might have some suggestions, um, but I'm, I'm not too familiar with methods to treat and control gypsy moths. Um, uh, I, I hope that helps and I'll try to pull up their website and, uh, and paste that in here as we're going along. Yeah, the insects definitely are not, um, not as much of a DIY for taking as, uh, as the plants, the plants you just pull and you could go out squishing gypsy moss with a rock or something, but you might be out there for a few weeks. <laughs> so yeah, so should I? Uh... All right. Uh, so that's the link, hopefully that, that helps. Yeah, uh, those forest pathogens are, are a big problem out there and we're all trying to grapple them. Um, yeah, before before we send everyone off uh, out there collecting JJ, oh, I, I have um, a few slides oh. also. Sure, yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> just, I, don't know. <laughs> I just had to. Uh, I was like, wait, no, not a, I can't have everybody hang up yet. Here we go. Um. Yeah, so I just wanted to go over a little bit of ID um, in case, you know, you don't even plan on undertaking the um, the app. And, and I think it's just helpful for everybody to be, everyone to know. A lot of people were uh, wondering about ID. Um, so I went over only a few species, especially the ones that we're going to see at High Falls since we started that uh, first project. Um, and just these few species I'm very passionate about. So uh, the first one is Tree of Heaven. Um, which, uh, you know, I'll just go over why, why it's so bad and, um, how to identify it. Um, it looks a lot like sumac, which I'll also bring up later. Um, but the, what it makes it distinct is, um, it has those little tear thumbs on the end of the, on the beginning of the leaves. Um, so just, it'll only jut out once and then be very smooth. And the seeds, um, are yellowish green and they turn pink as they mature. Uh, they look like little alien seed pods, uh, very freaky. Um, and if you even rustle the leaves at all, um, it smells what I call like a burnt popcorn and skunk fragrance. <laughs> um, so that's a really good identifying factor, but you might wanna wash your hands after. Um, there's 10 to 40 leaflets on the compound leaves. And you can see in the picture, that's what they look like from far away. Um, the bark is a little trickier. It's been helpful when I describe it as a cantaloupe texture. Um, it's dark gray and with, with a lighter gray um, in streaks and striations. Um, and the younger ones have, um, I think you can see, the, the younger ones have um, almost like an eye shape. It always looks like little eyes to me. Those are lenticels that, um, help with uh, aeration. Um, it allows gases to come in and out of the plant. Um, so those, those are also very distinct to it. And the reason that Tree of Heaven, um, the Latin name is Atlantis Altissima, is so bad is because when it gets cut, it sends out a hormone that knows that the plant is being attacked. And so it sends out additional root suckers up to 50 feet away. So 
you know, in my previous landscaping jobs, I've seen so many people cut this down or weed whack down a little tiny one. And then the next time that you come back there, there's a line of, you know, 20 of them. Uh, so I put don't mow because it'll only make the problem worse. Um, and these are really important data points to have uh, because really the only way to take these down is herbicide and you want, um, you know, professional organizations doing that and they do source their information from IMAP. So if you see this, it's very underreported because it's everywhere. So um, they're really, really looking for that data right now. Um, this is what happens when it flowers. I think they should be in flower soon, like mid July to August. Um, and those are just some more pictures of uh, the younger ones, the younger branch. Um, so yeah, they're very glossy looking. Um, it looks exactly like staghorn sumac. I could not tell the difference for a really long time. Sumac is good. We don't need to kill that one. Um, and it's really easy to tell because um, the leaves are serrated, whereas the leaves on the tree of heaven have those little tear thumbs at the beginning, the little sticky out parts, and then a smooth edge. And these edges are serrated, so if you, if you can get close enough to see that, or a little fuzz on the stem, then you can just breathe a sigh of relief, like I always do. <laughs> um, or, of course, if you see those cones that, um, that are those like reddish flowers, I've seen people make lemonade out of before on sumac, um, then that's not Ilanthus. So that's just a comparison photo of the two. So here are just some more pictures. Um, if you didn't know what I was talking about before, you do now. Um, and sometimes it's so easy to recognize the younger ones. The new growth will have like the, the reddish hue to the newer leaves um, that people don't realize that they can be canopy trees as well. So this is one of the things that we're dealing with at High Falls is that we have some pretty intense, you know, two foot DVH um, tree of heaven trees. And uh, that's, what, that's why the bark is important to know as well. Um, yeah, they very much show up on street sides and disturbed areas, as they say. And so the reason that I like to go over Tree of Heaven, especially now, is because if you've heard of the spotted lanternfly, like I mentioned, is one that I love to hate. Um, it specializes in Tree of Heaven. And so a plant that we thought was sort of no big deal a few years ago because it was everywhere, the tree of heaven. Um, they're really grappling to get some data on it now because there are, there's a hypothesis that the spotted lanternfly populations will follow the tree of heaven populations as they spread. Um, but even though they especially like tree of heaven, um, they feed on more than 70 plant species. Um, so they'll go from one tree that they like to another tree that they like but they'll hit every tree in between, which makes them so detrimental to beach mixed hardwood forests. And they especially, the Department of Agriculture, like I mentioned, is freaking out because uh, they love grapes, apples, hops, uh, maples, just stone fruits. Um, so there are vineyards that are just annihilated um, by these insects in a matter of days and you know new york's apples are taking a huge hit and they're worried about uh maples for maple syrup and so once you once you hit new york in the wine beer and cider we get scared <laughs> and that's what this bug has done um and they they actually don't use um the sugars so they excrete the sugars and more so want the proteins and fats in the plant and as they excrete the sugars um just a uh, layer of sugary gook, almost like, you know, syrup, um, just covers the areas beneath the infestations that they call honeydew. Um, I'm actually not even the person that wrote gross. That was from IMAP. It is gross <laughs> and it causes uh, a lot of fungal infestation. So if they don't kill the tree by eating it, then they kill it by inadvertently giving it a fungal infection with sooty mold. Um, so we don't know a lot about those plants yet, or about the, these insects yet. Um, that's why they're looking for data on Tree of Heaven so much, and if you see one of these, um, it would be not only good to put into IMAP, but also, um, 
if you go to the DEC website, they have a specific person to call because that's how much information they need on it right now. Um, they're really big in Pennsylvania is where they started. Um, and this is one of the hardest things probably to look for. Um, but the egg masses of spotted lanternfly, they pretty much resemble dried mud. At first they thought that they only liked flat surfaces, but now they find out it's pretty much a lot of <laughs> most surfaces. Um, so especially trees. So um, I was looking into this when I worked at garden centers, knowing that the quarantine area for spotted lanternfly is in central Pennsylvania. If we got an order from central Pennsylvania, I would look at every single tree to make sure I didn't see these egg masses. Um, so if you happen to be gardening and you get something from somewhere else um, and you see something like this, it's definitely something to look at a few times. But that's more so why the Tree of Heaven matters is why I bring that up. Um, and this is a really, really uncommon one that you guys have never heard of. <laughs> Just kidding, it's Japanese not weed. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people probably know a lot about this plant because it's everywhere. Um, but this is another one that we have at High Falls and at a few of the other PCAs, which is problematic. Um, this one is as bad as the Tree of Heaven because it uh, reproduces vegetatively. So if I break off a stem and I throw it over there, um, then a plant will grow over there. I think it's even been known to grow from even a leaf, although there's less of a chance. So it's, like I said, pretty insidious. Um, and the reason that it's a problem is because it grows in riparian areas, um, which changes the soil quality and the way that stream banks erode, um, because nothing else can grow there, obviously, if that poor guy can't even walk around in there. Um, but the reason that Japanese knotweed is underreported is partially because it's so common and people say, you know, okay, yeah, obviously that's there. I want to get something more interesting, um, but it's definitely important to get and and it also looks different every time of the year. So I just had some images. These all came from Green County Soil and Water Conservation, which also has a lot of good resources on invasives. Um, so in the early spring, they look like pink asparagus a little bit. And everybody says you can eat knotweed, which is true. I think that's how we can feed the whole world. But this is the only stage that you can eat it in. If you're, for some reason, interested in doing that, you can saute them, I believe. And in the summer and fall, they're flowering um, and uh, a little easier to identify, especially because they're everywhere. Um, and, and in the fall um, and winter, they just become these massive stands of what looks like old dried up bamboo. Um, the flowers also are the seeds. So the more little pieces that fall off of that fluffy white flower, um, the more it's spreading. Um, and the other thing that is like a huge point of contention with Japanese knotweed is beekeepers love knotweed because bees love knotweed. Um, and it produces like a darker, sweeter honey, apparently. Um, so I just like to include when I talk about knotweed that even though the bees love it, um, the issue is that it only blooms for about two weeks out of the year. And if the bees can pollinate that for those two weeks super heavily, then they're not going to pollinate any of the other native species. And so we're losing native species every time that happens. So yeah, that's my, uh, my chance to nerd out on, <laughs> on Invasives ID and I love it's on this slide, but also Doug has dropped it in the chat box a couple times. And um, the if I didn't do a good job with uh, going over IMAP or there's something that you still had questions on, the IMAP website has a lot of resources and step-by-step -step videos, which even I've referred to if I don't know how to do something. Um, so I would definitely recommend that. If you have any other questions, I'll stop sharing quickly. And it's also very nice to meet all of you because I haven't yet and I, I don't know when I will, but it's good to see that there are some faces out there, even if you're in your own homes. <laughs> Appreciate it a lot. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you, JJ. Thank you, everyone. Um, I know uh, Glenda hasn't put this in the chat box, but she shared uh, via email with me last week that there has been some uh, advancement on a biocontrol for knotweed uh, out there through Cornell. Um, and some researchers over that way. So, uh, you know, 
always keep up on the the news around invasives because there is some hope out there. Um, I know personally when I finally understood how many plants I was looking at were invasive plants, I felt a, a deeply overwhelmed um, and it can seem like a lot and that's why I encourage you all to pick your battles um, and you know particularly uh, you know don't don't have it be the end of you but do keep putting up a fight because um, I think it's our responsibility for uh, inviting all of the plants, whether they intended to or not, to be a part of our ecosystem. Um, so save the stuff that you can, remove the stuff that you can, um, and certainly with this, collect as much data as you can. Um, you know, so